everybody. Today we're going to take a look at how we classify living things. And nowadays that is done through what we call systematics and phylogeny. So what we're going to do first is we're going to take a look at why there's a need to classify living things and then how systematics and phylogeny play their part. So let's take a look at a simple example. So upon first glance, one would probably classify this as a, and there's no doubt in my mind, a word is probably jumping into your head right now, as it was the first time that I saw it, but um, on, upon closer inspection, we find that it isn't actually a snake. Instead, it is a different species altogether. So let's look at some of the things that make this animal not a snake. First, there's no fused eyelid. Second, no short terior posterior to the anus. And third, no highly mobile jaw. Those three things are key attributes of snakes, and this doesn't have them. So this is actually what we call a legless lizard. At one time long ago, it did have legs, but over time, developmental changes and evolution have changed this organism, so it no longer needs them, but it's still successful in the environments that uh, it lives in. So then we are interested in organizing life correctly. We don't want to make mistakes saying an organism looks like one thing, so it must be that thing. And the branch of biology concerned with identifying, naming, and classifying organisms, of course, is taxonomy. Chances are early in your biology class you covered this, but let's give it a go one more time. So what we have here is we have a gray wolf, and what we're going to do is we're going to go through the various levels of taxa, and hopefully we remember uh, the different names from top to bottom of how to classify this thing. Now, uh, what I do is I like to think of a quick little reminder statement, and it goes something like this. In my head, I say, dumb kids playing chess on freeways get squished. And that's usually enough for me to remember so I can hit all the levels from top to bottom. So, of course, with D, my darn, I have domain. Next is kingdom. And if you remember, um, we've kind of uh, messed around with the whole five kingdom thing and it's no longer in play. Uh, we took away the kingdom ship of the protists because we found with uh, newly discovered DNA and RNA sequences that they're actually closer to the plants and animals and fungi than they are to each other. Uh, so next, after kingdom, we have phylum. Whoops, there we go. I misspelt it. Uh, phylum. Uh, next is class. Then we have order, family, there we go, make a better L there, genus, and lastly, species. Okay, so we have a domain eukarya, kingdom animalia, phylum chordata, class mammalia, order carnivora, family canidae, genus canis, and species lupus. That's a lot of things in the name. But remember, we are classifying this from the most specific thing, which is the species, all the way to the broadest term, in this case is domain. And we'll look at how each level is nested in the one above it in just a minute. So um, actually, let me throw that term at you right now. When we say that a group is being nested, it means that it exists in the level above it, usually with multiple other groups as well. So each one of these lower groups is nested in the one above it. And I'll go ahead and I'll show you an example of how that works in the next slide. So if you're having trouble with a nested idea, I want you to think of your global address. So think of your regular address that you write on an envelope right now, but you also have a global address. And what we can do is we can start at the very large and we can work our way to the very small. Uh, for example, we all live on planet Earth, and that is a pretty big place, and so do 7 billion other peoples that have their own address as well. Second, uh, we live in a certain hemisphere, okay? I happen to live in the northern hemisphere and the western hemisphere, so I live in a couple of them as well as everybody else. Uh, I live on the continent of North America. I live in the country of the United States. My state is Michigan. My city... I'm not going to give my city, but my city is somewhere in Michigan, and uh, I live on a particular street, and I have a particular address. Now, of course, a whole bunch of other people have addresses on my street as well, and that allows my street address to be nested on the street that I live in. 
And my street is one of many in my city. And my city, of course, is one of very of many in my state. And I can go on and on. So each small thing is nested into a bigger level. Okay, so each level of organization then, taxa is plural. And so each individual one is not a taxa, but it's a tax on. And this particular... Uh, break down an organization for this organism. This is uh, Parthenocystis kinkifolia, also known as the Virginia creeper. And uh, you can see that uh, we can go through those same things. Darn kids playing uh, chess on freeways get squished. Domain Eukarya, Kingdom Plantae, uh, the phylum is Anthophyta, uh, class Eudicotyledone, order Vitales, family Vitaceae, genre is Parthenocystis, and then the species name Kinkafolia. All right. So a taxon, then, is a group of organisms that fills a particular category of classification. And it depends on which one you're looking at. So each one of these is an actual taxon. So there's multiple levels of taxa, plural, as we try to classify a particular organism. In the mid-18th century, Carolus Linnaeus developed the binomial system of nomenclature to classify organisms. So binomial nomenclature means a two-part name. And those two parts are these. The first word is going to be the genus. The second word is the specific epithet. This refers to one species of potentially many within the genus. So we saw the gray wolf as being Canis lupus, but there's a number of other specific epithets that sit under the heading genus of Canis. So uh, lupus was just one for the gray wolf. There's also a red wolf and there's plenty more, um, but we don't have time for that right now. Okay, uh, so a species will then be referred to by its full binomial name, its genus and its species. The genus name can be used alone to refer to a group of related species. So if I'm talking about wolves, I'm going to say Canis, the Canis group, because I'm covering all the different subtypes, uh, all the different species of wolves that exist. So I want you to also think about the need for proper classification. And I do that through a question that you see here. What is unique about these fish? So you see jellyfish, crawfish, and silverfish. Okay, so what's unique about them? Well, the answer may be surprising. None of them are actually fish. So a jellyfish is what we call a cnidarian. Crawfish and a silverfish are arthropods, and one's, a, one's an insect. So the fact they all have fish as part of their common name doesn't do a whole lot of someone trying to classify out different organisms. And also, these are uh, all three of these are listed by their common names. So each one of these would be better served if it had something more specific. So let's zero in on crawfish just for a minute. It's a very popular um, American arthropod. And if we go around region to region in the United States, we might find different ways of referring to a crawfish. And here are some. A crayfish, a crawdad, a freshwater lobster, or a mud bug. All right, so those four things uh, might lead to some, uh, I guess we could say some trouble if you're trying to explain to someone what something is. So one person's crayfish might be another person's crawdad and freshwater lobster and mud bug. So what we're looking for in biology is a more uh, standard system of naming that allows us to zero in on exactly the species that we're talking about. So there's a need for scientific names. And those needs come from the fact that common names will vary locally and globally. Languages vary. Often things are lost in translation. And, you know, to have a system in play that everybody uses is going to allow us all to know exactly the type of species we're referring to. So just like the metric system. The metric system is based on the number of 10. And it's very easy to convert from one unit to another. And about 99% of the countries on planet Earth use the metric system because that language of measuring things is so easy and so universal. Okay, some important information coming your way. When referring to a species or writing it down, you should italicize both your genus and species. You should capitalize the genus name. However, you're going to leave the species name as lowercase. 
You can use a single capital letter with the species name if you mentioned it previously. So what that means is if I've written a report on Canis lupus and I keep referring back to that species, what I'm going to do in every, uh, every case in the future of the report every, uh, from that point forward is I'm going to use the capital letter C which represents Canis and then I'm going to use the lowercase for the rest of it and that's just going to cut down the writing and we know it's, we're talking about Canis lupus if we see C lupus for the rest of the report. Um, importantly whatever the organism is named you're going to know it's and notice it has a Latin ending and that's actually part of the rules of naming organisms. So we have these rules out there. Um, however, wherever there's rules, of course, um, scientists like to have a little bit of fun too. So what they're going to do is they're going to come up with names for organisms as they're discovered. And there is some freedom in that too, which you'll see in a second. So classification is going to list the unique characters of each taxon, and it's intended to reflect phylogeny. So what's all this about? Well, if you're going to put something in a group, the chances are it's going to have some of the same physical attributes as the others in that group. And it's intended to reflect this world, word called phylogeny, which is an evolutionary history of a particular organism. But sometimes, and you're going to see this by the naming, it's not always the case. Check this out. So biologists, we all have good sense of humor, of course, and uh, we even utilize that as we name new species as we find them. So here's just an example of a number of species that have very unique uh, genus and species names. So we have a little bit of fun with that. But in having fun with that, and trying to put things together in groups, it tends to uh, get away from the serious and get into just naming stuff whatever, it seems like. There are rules, though. There are two governing organizations. We have the International Code of Zool Zoological Nomenclature, the ICZN, and the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature for Plants, of ICBN. And here's what they say. They say authors should exercise reasonable care and consideration of forming new names to ensure that they are chosen with the subsequent uses in mind that are as far as possible they are appropriate, compact, euphonious, and memorable, and do not cause offense. But, you know, that is not obviously the aim of biologists. They're out there to, you know, show the rest of the world they're finding. But something is lost there. We lose a little bit of any connection to how that species came about when we just have the two-part name. So there's a weakness with Linnaeus' system. And in fact, if we can utilize another system, which we'll talk about in a little bit, it might be a more valid way to explain why an organism exists by the group that it's in because it shares attributes from the past. So as we try to figure out where organisms came from, what's going to come into play is a type of way of thinking about that called systematics. So systematics is going to lead us to what we call phylogeny, the evolutionary history. What's found in systematics? Well, as you can see here, we're going to use fossil record data to help us figure it out. We're going to use comparative anatomy and development. And also we're going to use molecular data to determine what those evolutionary relationships are. So how do we go ahead and decipher evolutionary history? Well, a goal of systematics is then to determine that phylogeny. Okay, so phylogeny and evolutionary history, we're basically talking about the same thing here. Okay, one is just a much smarter sounding word than evolutionary history. So Linnaeus' system, as I said before, it provided little information about that phylogeny. And we're going to visually show phylogeny through a phylogenetic tree, a diagram indicating lines of descent. Now, what those trees look like is what you see here. Each branching point that you see is a divergence from a common ancestor. So this one here, we have one, two, three, four, five different common ancestors. And the first most recent common ancestor is going to give rise in this case to the bear and the chimpanzee. Now, are there other species amongst the bear and chimpanzee from the common ancestor? Of course, this is just two that it's showing, but there are hundreds and thousands of species that also come from that common ancestor. But if you track back past the common ancestor of a bear and a chimpanzee, you then get to a four, uh, four legged animal that also gave rise to lizards. 
lizards and uh, probably the rest of the reptile family. If we go further back than that, we get into the amphibian group and uh, we don't have as developed lungs. We, we now have skin that uh, aids in our respiration, uh, mucus coating. We always have to stay in an aquatic or, or nearly aquatic environment that's always wet. If we go further back than that, we find the fish family and further back than that, the lamprey family. So in this, we have a lot of common ancestors, but you got to basically take steps back as you look at the groups that are involved in this particular comparison. All right, now each one of these branching points is also called a node. So in here we have one, two, three, four, five different nodes as well. So when constructing a tree, we're going to use two types of characters in order to do so. First, we're going to use common characters, and that means that it's present in all members of the group and present in the common ancestor. Second, we're going to use derived characters that are present in some members of a group, but absent in the common ancestor. Those traits were not seen previously. So what we could say is that the common characters might exist from this species to um, this branching point here and taxon A, B, and C all wound up with the same character. But at some point, these, if you keep tracking back, those common characters were not there. And that would then make it a derived character. So let's say at the um, at the most uh, at the furthest back ancestor of all these species of A through F, this one here, this common ancestor does not have the same characteristics A, B, C has. And instead, that's the whole reason why it branched to the uh, to the left here. So it gained some new attribute here and it stayed with all of the species that wound up here. Now that attribute is what allowed this group here on the right to go this way instead because they did not share it whatsoever. So D, E, and F do not share whatever that attribute was that A, B, and C have. So they still have the common character, but they don't have, in case, if we use a, a color here, this, this red characteristic, that is derived. So actually, let me write that down. So red equals derived. But I, we can also say that this group also, um, sorry, this group here has the common characteristic. There we go. Okay, uh, a couple other things that we could say is uh, in this group to the right or bottom, we also find what's called a polytomy. And a polytomy is when you find a pitchfork like structure in your phylogenetic tree. And uh, we notice that multiple branches come off the same node. If that occurs, it means that there's a little bit of unknown information there. We're not exactly sure how D, E, and F came about. And that's why we kind of have this perpendicular line crossing here at the node and uh, multiple species coming off of them. Whereas on the top part here, we definitely have a left and a right, kind of like an either or kind of deal. And then we have the same thing going on here. So in that case there, there's a lot more solid evidence as to why one species branched into two versus if you have a pitchfork with multiple prongs at the same node and then we're not exactly sure that's how they show it in a phylogenetic tree. All right, so here we have another one showing uh, we have a whole bunch of different species here, cat family, weasel family, and dog family. And uh, what we can point out in this one here is that we have what's called sister taxa. And if you look at the end of your phylogenetic tree, where it breaks it down further and further and further to species, you're going to notice that sometimes you're going to get two species that are really close together. So in this case here, we have a coyote and a wolf, and they're sister taxa. So those two species share an immediate common ancestor right here. And it also means that their DNA and RNA are probably very similar as well. We can also uh, take a look at uh, where the root of all the species in your phylogenetic tree is. For example, the cats, the weasel family, the dogs, they all wind up at the same common ancestor. And this one happens to be uh, a good deal back from out here on the right-hand side. In fact, it's uh, we got it way over here at the 
carnivore node back here. So all these guys here on the right, these are all carnivores. And the closest we can link them all together is way back here at carnivore status. All right. We can also say um, that it is what we call the root species. Uh, if we think of a tree where all these things out here are the branches, well, the root is what anchors it down into the ground, and that's the most common point where all the branches might meet, or the trunk, we could say. But this is the root species, and it's the most common ancestor of all the species you see on here. And surprising to many, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but if you look at the Felidae family, it takes a left right here, whereas a uh, weasel family, the Mustilidae, and the Canidae take a right. So what that means in terms of genetics is that the weasel family is actually closer to our canines than the uh, uh, the cat species, the felidae. They're further away. A lot of people don't know that. They also don't know that hyenas, as dog-like as they are, are actually closely, more closely related to the felidae family than they are the canidae family. Just FYI. We can also talk about the weakness of phylogenetic trees. Unless there are specific dates at the bottom of the tree um, that will be uh, help uh, be evidenced by... Um, archaeological digs and fossil records, we don't always know what the absolute ages of the species are and where breaks occurred. So what we could say then is that here we have a branch point where the coyote and the wolf diverged from each other. Here we have a branch point where the badger diverged from the otter. But unless there's fossil evidence that has been dated, we can't be sure which one of these things here happened first. So in these cases, we know there was a break, we know something happened, but because the fossil record is incomplete, or if someone hasn't done the proper testing yet, we can't always be sure which one happened first. Um, so that is a weakness of a phylogenetic tree if it is undated. Um, also, please communicate to others as you learn more biology that sister taxa does not mean that one species came from another. So um, what I mean by that, if, if we look and focus in on the uh, Canis latrans and Canis lupus, the coyote and the wolf, we know that they're very closely related. They are sister taxa, but that doesn't mean that one came from the other one. Instead, we track back, and at some point, speciation occurred. This one went one way, this one went the other way on a genetic basis, and after some time, they were no longer able to successfully interbreed with each other. It doesn't mean that one came from another. Often, you'll hear people come with the argument saying they didn't come from a chimpanzee or they didn't come from a gorilla or an ape. And we all know that that didn't happen, but we all do share a common ancestor. We all just went our own uh, unique evolutionary path to where we are today. So, through the weakness of the Linnaeus system of binomial nomenclature and groupings, some systematics now propose that classification be based solely on evolutionary relationships, on the phylogeny only. And that is new ideas called the phylo code. So this is only going to name groups with a common ancestor and all of the descendants that it has. So what that's going to do, it's going to basically take those ranks back out. So species are no longer going to have ranks like family, order, and class. And instead, is going to lump some unique groups together. We already started doing it with the protists. They lost their kingdomship, and now because they're closer to uh, fungi and animals and plants, we are now going to start putting them in those groups. And this owl right here is going to become part of the reptile group instead of saying, staying in a unique bird group that's unrelated to reptiles. So why should we study phylogeny? Who cares anyways? Well, there's some important reasons. If a major species is, uh, species is decimated and we need to bring that species back, what would we do? So it might be a keystone species that provides something for our survival. So by knowing the closest relatives of a species, that may provide a reservoir for genes that are found in the lost species. So one example we could use would be corn. Okay, so corn is the number two crop in the United States and probably all over the world as well. And it's so important because of its food capabilities and the thousands of other products that uh, we make from corn. So 
the scary part is that corn is a monoculture for the most part. We have multiple species of corn, but we really stick to a couple big ones and that's about it. And what that means is if a virus is able to find the code for corn and do severe damage to it, it could wipe out huge fields and, and, and kilometers and miles upon miles of corn because they're all the same. So if we know other species of corn that are related might have come before through its phylogeny. We might be able to do some genetic engineering, um, we do some transplanting of genetic info from one species to another and bring back the lost species. So today's world is uh, a monoculture kind of world when it comes to plants and we need to have some uh, diversity amongst those plants so those viruses and those threats can't take out the whole lot of them at the same time. Another uh, example that comes to mind is the anthrax post 9-11 attacks. Through um, using genetics and breaking down the genetic code of the anthrax spores that were found um, in the weaponized anthrax after 9-11, they were able to then trace it back into species and a location where that particular um, genetic unique combination of DNA material was found and eventually find a location where that weaponized anthrax was made. So what kind of data allows us to infer phylogenetic information? Well one type of data is morphological and that's physical attributes of living things. The second one is molecular. So if, the, if one is phenotype, the other one is going to be genotype if you remember your genetics chapter. All right, so in morphological, we're going to focus in on the, uh, in this case, in the bones of four limbs of mammals. And here we have five different mammals, and we can see one common characteristic between all of them. Actually, about uh, a little bit more than that, because we have a scapula in each one of these mammals. We have a three-boned forelimb. So each one of these has a humerus, a radius, and an ulna. So that is a one common homology we see there. Uh, we also see some form of wrist uh, type structure in the carpals and the metacarpals and even the phalanges that we find at the end. Well, a horse doesn't have phalanges, but some of the other ones do. But the key thing here is there is a similarity between all these species, which is, of course, evidence that chances are we're pretty closely related if we have the exact same bone structure in terms of the types of bones that are there, not exactly how they look, but the fact that they all are there. And um, if we look at other animals, like if we go to the in insect world, they don't have bones. They don't have a, a three-boned forelimb, nor do they have a scapula. So we're very different from those, but we are very close to mammals. If you looked up mammal features, you'd find that a lot of us share a lot of the same similar characteristics. Now, on the other hand, we have molecular data as well, and that's the genes and the DNA sequences uh, that we can find that can also be homologous if they're descended from a common ancestor. We'll get into that in a minute. Now, take a look at these two animals for a second. As far as how they look, their morphological uh, phenotype, their morphological appearance, they look kind of similar. Now, of course, the coloration is different, but they kind of do the same thing. Um, they both kind of dig around in the ground. They're pretty flat, short tails, um, uh, eyesight not very good, hands that kind of look like flippers or diggers because they're both types of moles. One is an Australian mole, and the other one is a North American mole. Now, as different as, or as similar as these two look, there's gonna be some key differences because they do not share a very common ancestor. In fact, the most common ancestor you could get to would be a long time ago when Pangaea was still all together. Because once you strip away the outside look to this and you looked on the inside, they look incredibly different. So environmental selection factors, one in North America, one in Australia, and ecological niches, these have uh, selected for attributes that allow these two little critters to look alike. However, genetically speaking, they're very different from each other. Um, if we take a, just focus in on the reproductive system, the Australian mole is a marsupial, which means that it completes its uh, development in a pouch, whereas the North American mole is a eutherian, which means that 
it develops in a uterus. So a reproductive system that's completely different from the other one is going to lead to more evidence that these probably don't share a very common ancestor. It's probably somewhere way far back a long time ago. And it's just those selective pressures of the different environments that they live that allowed each one to be successful in its own way and pushed it to basically do the same thing, to have the same ecological niche um, as one another. Here's another example in the, what we were talking about where we have um, analogous structures such as wings um, because wings allow flight, of course. And we're going to call these homoplasies because selective pressures have allowed all three of these types of wings to develop in order for that particular species to be more successful. However, they come from very different evolutionary paths. Their phylo phylogenies are way different. But um, if you take a look at the insect wing, for example, we mentioned the boneless aspect to an insect. It doesn't have bones, but it can still fly. So the fact that it can fly is not a homologous type of thing. Instead, it's an analogous type of thing. Instead, it, it developed this over millions upon mi millions of years that it could be more successful if it could actually fly to get away from predators and to derive nutrition and to reproduce more successfully. Now, if we take a look at the bat and the bird, which are closer, evolutionarily speaking, we can take a look at this little mini tree over here and see what happens. So birds kind of went their own way, which you can see here. They went to the right. And then some kind of common ancestor here went the other direction. So there were some kind of four-legged um, individual root species, but you know that may have been more reptile-like than anything. And those, um, those scales eventually wound up evolving into feathers, which allowed it eventually to take up a flight type of response to having um, you know, these converted scales on their skin. And eventually, powered flight became part of its arsenal for survival. But on this, if you take a left here, from the reptile species. Instead, that left the species, the common ancestor, crawling on the ground. And you can see at this point here, there was a mouse-like species that branched from the common ancestor. But something happened here to go to the left, which allowed a little bit of webbing to exist underneath the forelimb and to the body of this particular, uh, of this particular uh, animal. So maybe, you know, upon thousands of years, this animal using those flaps of skin that developed over time glided from tree to tree and eventually uh, through, you know, births and deaths and, and ultimately, you know, random combinations of genes started moving its arms and obtaining the ability to fly after a while, which allowed it to get away from predators, find more food, etc., etc. So, uh, very unique in the case that these two species here each independently involve, uh, evolved their ability to fly. Um, one was flying uh, after its reptile form. The other stayed on the ground. Mice went one way, staying on the ground, but bats developing um, you know, this webbed appearance between the bones of the forelimb allowed it to fly and still around today because uh, it was a it was a trait that allowed it for more evolutionary fitness. Here is some molecular data that we can kind of take apart and try to figure out what's going on here. It looks pretty complicated. But let's try to simplify a little bit. Okay, so if this phylo uh, phylogenetic tree is a representation of what we see above, let's take a look and let's start with species A and B down here at the bottom. Now, a and B, if we go through the code, it's kind of hard to follow, but we can see that there's a lot of similar letters between A and B. And if we look at three spots in particular, at 2, 4, and 7, these are going to be some bases that are going to differentiate them from the other species in this tree. For example, A and B are pretty far away from species C and D because they don't share any of those same nitrogenous bases at position 2, 4, or 7. A's versus T's, A's versus C's, and C's versus A's. Now, um, if we take a look at species C and D, at position number 1, 
they each have G's, but nothing else really shares it. C's for everything else. So they kind of go their own direction up here and eventually diverge from one another um, at a later time. Now, if we look at some other species here, E, F, G, and H, which all seem to share the same part of this tr tree right in the center right here, what is it that makes the four of these so much more alike? Well, we can look at the fact they all share position three, so they all have T's at this location. Uh, species E and F and G and H, they diverged though, whereas species E and F have A's at the sixth location, and species G and H have C's at the five location. So we can see even by more uh, by molecular data, we can take a look at the differences and similarities amongst different species and kind of uh, hypothesize together what the evolutionary relationship might be. And what we're finding is more and more is that this DNA and RNA information is extremely reliable as opposed to the fossil record and uh, homologous structures and things like that. They're all evidence, but DNA and RNA seem to be our new emerging leader in the quality of evidence that allows to relate one species to another. Analogous scenarios may also exist in molecular data. Now, if you take a look at these sequences down here, you can see that in various spots you find matches, a, a C's, A's, here's got a C and T, and here's a G. But if you look at everything else, everything else is absolutely different. And what that means is that it's an analogous structure, um, but within the nucleus of a cell. So in this case, it's just coincidence. It's coincident these letters happen to match. We call it a molecular homoplasy. So um, don't derive, don't try to glean too much worthwhile evidence from that because you're not going to find as much. Uh, most worthwhile data will look actually more like this, where it's you know, if you're looking at related species, it's going to be very, very similar. Look at some of the percentages that we share with other mammals, and you'll be astounded by the percent that matches. So cladistics is a fancy word for an approach to systematics. It's based on common ancestry, and we utilize the idea of a clade. A clade in, uh, includes ancestral species and all of its descendants. So let's take a look at some examples. Here we have three different examples where we can differentiate what a clade is versus a group. Only a clade is going to be consist of what we call a monophyletic group. It consists of all the ancestral species, or sorry, it consists of the ancestral species and all of its descendants. So in this case here, at our first example, we can see that species A, B, and C, which we're going to call group one, all of them seem to come from this common ancestor right there. So that makes this particular group we're focusing in on a clade. Second, a paraphyletic group consists of the ancestral species and some, but not all, of its descendants. So in this case here, we can clearly see there's a common ancestor, but what we have is we have a species that doesn't quite get in there. This species G here doesn't make it into the group, and that's why we're going to call it a paraphyletic group and not a clade. Third, we're going to look at a polyphyletic group, and that includes taxa with different ancestors. So in this case here of the DE F and G species, they all have the common ancestor there, they radiate out, but species C has made it in there and it has a completely different common ancestor. So then we would call it a poly polyphyletic group and not actually a clade. When inferring evolutionary relationships, it's useful to know in which clade a shared derived character first appeared. So let's take a look at some of these characters. We have a shared ancestral character, and that exists here as a vertebral column for the species of lamprey through leopard. Now you'll notice that the lancelet does not have that shared ancestral character. It does not have a vertebral column. It has a notochord, but it doesn't have a vertebral column. We also see a shared derived character. And in this case here, after vertebral columns, hinge jaws, four walking legs, amniotic egg, 
we develop hair over time, and the leopard has hair. So this derived character means that something has now shown, uh, has evolved this new character, that it wasn't seen before in common ancestors. We also need to select an outgroup. An outgroup is a species from an evolutionary heritage that diverged before the lineage we are studying. So what that means is that all of these that we're looking at here, if we were focusing in on these, they are called the in-group. And you can see that there. So these guys here are the in-group. That means we have an out-group. And in this case here, an out-group is going to be the lancelet. And let me take my little owl away here so you can see what we're talking about. So here, the lancelet does not have a vertebral column. So it is on its own as the out-group. In some trees, the length of a branch can reflect the number of genetic changes that have taken place in a particular DNA sequence in that lineage. So in this case here, you can see that some of the species don't have a whole lot of changes, but some do. So if we ask the question, which species has gone through the most genetic change, I hope you would say definitely not the Drosophila, not the fly. In fact, it stayed relatively the same over time. Of course, there's been changes, but not anything compared to how many changes these have gone through and how many common ancestors. So in this case, the mouse and the human have gone through the absolute most genetic change of all the species here on the, this phylogenetic tree. This particular uh, table up above is showing the percent differences between sequences in various species. So human versus mushroom versus tulip. And what we can see here is that the difference between a human and a mushroom is about 30% between sequences and a human and a tulip is about 40%. Um, a mushroom and a tulip have about a 40% difference as well. So one of the things that we got to look at is, is this evidence fitting for a particular phylogeny for a group of species. Systematists can never be sure of finding the best tree in a large set of data. It's more helpful if there's small data that we can look at and break down like this as we try to tackle a bigger problem. They narrow possibilities by applying the principles of maximum parsimony and maximum likelihood. The principle of maximum likelihood states that given certain rules about how DNA changes over time, a tree can be found that reflects the most likely sequence of evolutionary events. So maximum likelihood um, is related to this thing that we know called Occam's razor. Occam's razor said all things being equal, the simplest answer is usually the correct one. So there's a variety of different ways that we can kind of take a look at the evol evolutionary history of a number of different species. But one way is going to be simpler than the other and be the most likely way that they diverged from each other. Maximum parsimony, on the other hand, assumes that the tree that requires the fewest evolutionary events, whereas we could say appearances of shared derived characters, is the most likely. So between the two of these, we can usually say the simplest tree is going to be the correct one. And if we take a look at these two pictures down here, we can see that there is a common ancestor amongst the human, the fungus, and the plant. And this would be tree number one. And we could contrast that with tree number two and then try to figure out which one is more likely. Now, species have the ability to change over time. And most of the time, there is a background rate to mutations and genetic change that is there, it is evident, and it's relatively equal among species. So if we take a look at the, this tree versus that tree, we're gonna find that the one on the left, this tree here, is definitely more equal in time, uh, in changes over time than the one on the right. The right shows that there was a divergence between uh, fungi and then there was a common ancestor between a human and a, and a plant where the plant changed rather rapidly over time. The human changed, uh, the human changes were, were slower and the fungus was even slower than that. And then we have the one on the left, tree number one, where we had both the human and the fungus go their own separate ways from the plants and that was more evenly distributed over time. So what that leads to is the idea, the hypothesis, that this is more likely than this here, and DNA evidence will back that up. 
So in conclusion, remember that phylogenetic trees are hypotheses. As new information is found, these hypotheses can be supported or rejected. The best hypotheses for phylogenetic trees fit the most data, the morphological data, the molecular data, the fossil data. And all of that data has allowed us to do even more hypothesizing. For, uh, uh, in fact, if we took a look at this owl and we were able to trace it back in time, we could then give some of these traits of the owl and apply them or infer that the dinosaurs probably had these traits first. And because the owl is still around today, the owl is harboring some of those same traits. But of course, because we don't have dinosaurs to look at and watch and study today, we can only use this data that we have today from the molecules, the morphology, and the fossils to imagine what those dinosaurs may have been like. So I hope this helped open up your understanding to the need for taxonomy, the way that we look at taxonomy, and the way that we want to reflect taxonomy now in evolutionary history versus just a big pool of uh, two-part names. So uh, keep on studying, and I'll catch you next time. Bye.